Okay, this is getting ready. Okay, so now we're on live stream. I'll get the... Okay, we are live and being recorded. So I'm gonna start off by welcoming everybody to the 14th annual Portland alt -S workshop. Uh, I think it's pretty impressive that we're still at this uh, after actually 15 years, we did miss a year. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this year's program. We have a lot of what I think will be very interesting and inspiring presentations as we always do. Um, but you know, as I say every year, I think this year is even more so. Um, so with, without you know, me babbling on, I uh, just wanted to again, thank you all for, for being here and for everyone who's watching on the live stream, welcome. Um, we'll start off with a, with a quick word from our founder, Dr. Russell Janae, who will give a, a brief um, uh, talk about how this all began and, and how he sees where, how we got into where we are now. So go ahead, Russ, take it away. Okay, I'll, uh, it says host is disabled participant screen sharing. Ah, okay, well, I'll take care of that. All right. Okay, I'll try it again. Hey, it works now. Okay. So Russ, is that a tandem telephone, uh, telescope control at your side there? That's right. Yeah, it's it's like a binocular telescope, but the mirrors are independent. Okay, so the, the uh, screen. I uh, let's bring this up full. There, does that look good? Yeah. Okay. So this this was the uh, first meeting. So what year was this, Howard? Oh, I think it was uh, back in the uh, 17th century. Yeah, I think like <laughs> it was a 2007, something like that. Yeah. And uh, that was uh, Dan's uh, lollipop telescope. And uh, very shortly as the meeting began, you, you brought in your 28 inch. And I said, I think that set the uh, tone of things. I was totally flabbergasted uh, how quickly you put it together. And uh, at any rate, the uh, <clears throat> so we, we had our initial. Uh, meeting and very soon after the first meeting, uh, we visited uh, large Altaz telescopes. And so the uh, uh, one on the upper left, that's Magdalena Ridge. And uh, it has the good uh, uh, Hubble mirror in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it was actually the other Hubble, but... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Any rate, the, uh, <laughs> uh, Tom Smith and I visited. We spent the whole day there in with the uh, with their chief engineer, and it was direct drive. And we actually crawled inside the direct drive, and I got was very impressed with direct drive. Dave and I uh, uh, visited the uh, telescope uh, maker down in Tucson, and also Roger Angel. We talked to Roger Angel about uh, large meniscus mirrors, and he said. Oh, that that wouldn't work, and then he started building them, and of course, uh, <laughs> Mel <laughs> did them. And uh, Dan and uh, I and a few others, we went to uh, uh, Mauna Kea. So here we are on the, on the uh, Subaru telescope, which is a direct drive, also by the way. There's uh, Dan, and uh, and then this was the uh, Gemini, uh, the eight meter Gemini telescope. At any rate, we got lots of ideas. The engineers and directors were all very helpful. And so we kind of, you know, how do we take things on large telescopes and make it on small telescopes? We had lots of meetings, I think, and not just at, at Portland, but at other places. This took place at Cal Poly about the same time as the Portland workshop. This was in Dallas. Uh, this one was uh, at White Sands 
uh, and this one was up in Canada. And so we, and there were quite a few others, but those were, and we had some major conferences. The one on the top here was uh, uh, at uh, by Cal Poly. It was in San Luis Obispo. You can see the uh, Cal Poly 18 there in the background, and the uh, there's one of the students said that. And a couple of the students there that uh, uh, worked on that telescope, uh, bequeathing it to uh, years of hard labor by Dan Howard <laughs> and Richard <laughs> to try to square it away. <laughs> uh, this was uh, uh, in Hawaii, uh, a very nice uh, conference. I, uh, I think the, here's Tom Johnson. I think it was probably his last uh, uh, conference. It was a very nice talk, and we did go over to uh, the Big Island afterwards. And this was one of my favorites. So this was on the Kona side of the Big Island. We actually held it at uh, Canada France Hawaii Telescope Headquarters. They just let us use their headquarters, and it, it was lots of fun. And so it was, I think, maybe near the zenith of of, of wild ideas on huge cheap aperture telescopes <laughs> but uh anyway the uh, here's a couple of books that the altas Institute put out uh, particularly the one on the right there uh has lots of the things that we did uh, uh kind of recorded and i think a, a main uh thing on on the altas initiative has been uh uh meniscus mirrors and so we're going to hear more about that that's uh is Mel, are you on yet? When do you think Mel started his first meniscus mirror? That must have been the second or third meeting? Uh, so somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah. yeah Mel is on, online here. I think he has his microphone turned off, though. Yeah. Anyway, Mel started a very good thing. Yeah. And, uh, and, <laughs> and of course, you, you have to slump these things to, to, to do them. And uh, so this this was a visit I made, and uh, and I is uh, is he still at it? Slumping mirrors? Um, I don't think so. No, I think he's taking his uh, kiln apart for now. Okay. And then Tong Tong went slumping, not but he didn't just slump one disc; he would slump two and fuse them together. <laughs> okay. Made him stiffer and. And Tong, you're up to one meter. How many one meter telescopes have you made now? Mirrors. Oh, we have we made about ten mirror, but this is the first telescope will be ready in about a month. First telescope will be ready uh, in a few weeks, a few weeks, I think. Excellent, excellent. So yeah. ten, <laughs> ten mirrors, excellent. And then we had the uh, the foam glass wow. mirrors. I I thought that was and I, I really miss. Uh, Andrew, he he was just a, a barrel of fun. He had that big uh, vacuum chamber in his uh, hang, his private hangar with his airplane. <laughs> but I think he's been working on anti gravity machines now. <laughs> and uh, and then we had Lisa Broadhacker and her uh, spin cast epoxy mirrors, and uh, I visited her down in uh, South Carolina, and. Uh, uh, last I heard, she's still working on uh, on that. She's got a number of grants, and uh, one thing we tried and didn't get quite working was uh, multiple mirrors. So Tong, if you remember, you made three uh, spherical mirrors, right? And they, I think they were eight inch mirrors, and, uh, and that's we, right, uh, ten inch actually. I think. Ten inch, yeah, uh -huh. and, and we identical. Made, we made the tip tilt mechanisms with a real fine screws and we tried to bring, you know, get them in phase, but the, the students, student graduated and we gave him his degree before he was finished. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then we have a, a long history of, you know, the sil silvering and, you know, trying to do something besides the uh, expensive uh, going and I, and I understand we have a talk this time about that, and uh, and then adjusting thin mirrors uh, for uh, you know kind of warp them into shape, and uh, there's still efforts uh, going on there. And if you can't do it on the primary mirror, work on the secondary mirror. So this was uh, Bruce uh, Holmstein and students 
uh, working on adaptive secondary mirrors. And uh, I think one of the great success stories besides meniscus mirrors with Mel is direct drives. And uh, uh, after I visited Magdalena Ridge, uh, I bought a book on direct drive motors and couldn't understand hardly anything in it. So I sent it to Dave uh, Rowe because I thought he might be, uh, understand. Of course, he, he understands all that sort of thing. And no time at all, he was winding coils in his shop garage. And uh, so here, here's the, for the first direct drive motor. And Dan, meanwhile, had made up a controller for it. And so this day, the two teamed up. And uh, this, um, this was probably, what year do you think this was, Howard? Mm, I'm guessing that's maybe about 2011, 2012. Yeah, that sounds about right. And who's, and but this is our friend from Canada, from Vancouver. <laughs> yeah. So what was his name? Craig Breckenridge. Yeah, Breckenridge, yeah. The, uh, and at any rate, that, then Dave spent, <laughs> Uh, what, a couple years, Dave, on the design for the CDK 700? I think Dave's quiet there. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> that was uh, the one I made in my garage, I think. Anyway, the first plywood one that you showed was definitely made in my garage. And, uh, this one has the uh, Teflon balls between the... <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of story, but anyway, when did we first build the CDK 700? It was 2007 or eight, I think. So I think it goes back quite a bit before. I think we started around 2007 in my garage and Dan working on um, the controller. Yeah, that's cool. And 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 as uh, Alan Holmes said in one of our little workshop. Big balls are better. <laughs> okay. And hey, so, hey, Dave. I just yeah. wanted to—I wanted to see if you could tell that story about uh, when you um, found the balls <laughs> jumping around. You like that story, huh? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> so I couldn't put the balls in the bearing groove. So, so this is an integrated um, drive plus. Uh, azimuth uh, bearing assembly and when i got the first one finished it was time to load the v-grooves the v-groove with the balls and i had bought stainless steel balls and the magnets jumped made the balls jump out of the channel so there was no way for me to load the balls into the uh v-groove and I was seriously bummed out. I went and had a beer. I actually went out to a bar and had a beer. And I sat there alone at a table. And I, when I was sitting there, I actually realized what to do. So I went back and I, because I had heard of, um, I heard of nitride uh, ball bearings. They're silicon nitride, I think. And I bought a package of those and um, I put them in and it worked. And <laughs> Dan loves that story. I think I wrote him an email. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I quickly figured out what to do and I got him the direct drive motor and he made the controller and we had a lot of fun. So then the uh, CDK 700 uh, morphed into the one meter. So Dave, that was another, what, couple years of engineering, right? The CDK 700. Yeah, from the CDK 700 to the uh, of 1000. Yeah, almost, well, almost everything that we've done has taken uh, three years. Mm -hmm. And everybody expects it to be done in 15 months, but it just doesn't happen that way. So after the CDK 700 um, was out and functioning well, I think we started in 2008. That would be 2011. I think we started to sell it about... A year or two after that, we started building the uh, designing the uh, one meter. So, yeah, I think we started probably in 2013. We sold the first one in 2016 ish. 
Yeah, so, you know, it was like, I don't know, seven, eight years between visiting Altaz telescopes on mountaintops and extracting good features from them to uh, populating many mountaintops with uh, telescopes that you need from that. At any rate, I think that's really cool. So uh, well, let, let me break in here real fast, yeah. uh, Russ, pardon me. Somebody out there has their mic on and is making a lot of loud scraping noises. So if, if you're out there listening and you're making scraping noises, could you turn off your microphone, please? Thank you. Okay, Russ. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no problem. And we've always been interested in instruments. Uh, I remember Dan uh, put, put a uh, one of the uh, Optech uh, near infrared uh, photometers on his uh, lollipop. And uh, this is uh, Greg Jones uh, worked on a, a, a camera. The, uh, and uh, I had a kind of aperture fever. This is a portable one meter telescope fix, fixed in, fit in the back of a Jeep Cherokee. And, uh, but the optics weren't very good, but it, it did work. And uh, the, uh, at any rate, so the kind of the latest thing that, that I've been kind of interested in and uh, it, several uh, Portland meetings ago, we, if you remember, we had the two students from uh, Cal Poly talking about a student space telescope network. And uh, that morphed in, so in January, 2020, right before COVID struck. This was the American Astronomical Society's uh, annual meeting in the uh, winter meeting in Honolulu. And uh, so I organized a uh, two-day workshop on CubeSat astronomy in the 2020s. And it was well attended. It was the best attended of, of the workshops. And, uh, and we, we were going to hold it in 2021, but COVID, so then we're going to do it in 2022. Anyway, we've got two meetings coming up. One is, oh, and that's not December 2nd, it's December 9th, a little air there. It's a week later. Uh, in Los Angeles, it'll be both online and uh, in person. Uh, it's going to be lots of fun, a one-day workshop. And then in June, we're going to have the finally have the two-day workshop, and it's going to be at the Pasadena uh, AAS meeting. At any rate, that's my a little introduction, I'll stop sharing here. Okay. And back to you, Howard. Thank you, Russ. It is a good reminder of the, uh, the road we've traveled to, to get to this point. Um, and uh, so we're gonna start off with the uh, rest of the program with Rob Brown talking about a 16 inch F3 meniscus project. And again, okay, whoever's you... out there making those scraping noises, um, it's really loud. So if you could, it seems like everyone has their mic off. So I don't know where that sound's coming from. I know I'm not making it. Anyway, go, go take it away, Rob. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Do you, do you hear any scraping sounds? Not at the moment. Well, it might have been me. I, I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. But uh, anyway, okay. So I'm going to share my screen, and you should see a, a nice looking Altaz telescope there in front of you. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Looking good. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for inviting me to this. Again, um, it's quite an honor, and uh, I'm going to take you through my personal journey in in making a meniscus mirror. Um, I'm also going to talk about the build of the telescope itself. Um, I, I really appreciated seeing the, the history that uh, Russ just walked us through. And um, I got this sense of um, uh, myself being lost in the woods, uh, you know, 25 years ago when I actually started this project. And um, it's really thanks to this group and, and Mel in particular that um, I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But um, so the, this introduction then uh, is basically a copy of my um, uh, blog that I, I have at this link right up here, um, Queenslight Spectre 1625 F31 Meniscus Mirror. And um, 
the way this thing started was way back in the 90s, I was um, convinced that someday the, the, the coolest thing would be to have a ceramic mirror. And I wasn't the only one, um, but I, I, you know, I gave it a, a good couple of years of trying and eventually I, I realized that um, it really wasn't worth it. The, the glazes weren't gonna stand up to what we needed and they, they all cracked eventually. And what I got out of it, and the reason why I'm showing it is I got this awesome uh, hexagonal ceramic thing that I made it was gonna be a mirror, but now it is a wonderful pushing tool for pushing glass around on top of a, a pitch lap, which is what it's doing here. So um, uh, the other thing that I also got out of it was when I realized that the glazes weren't gonna, weren't gonna work, I said, screw it, I'm just gonna uh, get a piece of Pyrex slumped, make it nice and thin, let's say three eighths of an inch. And since it was, it was gonna be F3 anyway, you know, I was like, okay, we'll do that. And, I'll, I'll, I'll bond it to the, uh, to the ceramic and I'll worry about coating later. Maybe I'll silver it. I don't know. This was 1997. And I got that thing polished out and um, I took one look at the uh, Ronke gram and, uh, and then I looked over my shoulder at my newborn kid and I was like, you know, I got to make a choice here. <laughs> I put the project away. So, um, and I traded my, my Miromatic for Howard's uh, Teleview Panoptic and, and, uh, and I just kept that thing in the, in the garage for all this time. Well then, um, Mel comes along and I realized that my gosh, I've got exactly the right blank. Uh, it is three eighths of an inch thick, it's F3, 16 inch diameter and I, I debonded it from the, uh, from the ceramic. I, I just used pitch anyway, so I was going to wait until later to epoxy it. And he said, yeah, you, you, you can make a mirror out of that, Rob. And that was very encouraging. So I, so I started working on it. And, um, you know, along the way, of course, I saw these things developing at the Oregon Star Party. I got to look in the 10-inch F2.7, and, and that really made me understand, oh, uh, this, is, this is a thing. It's not just... This isn't necessarily a Cassegrain primary mirror. This is, this is a Newtonian mirror too. And the things that you can see with it are uh, quite different than what you get with a long focal length telescope. So, um, you know, watch that develop. And Mel's doing a 25 and then a pair of 30s and Tom Otvos and his successes with the 14 inch. And, and you know, I just felt like, okay, well, I got a chance. I got a fighting chance of being, being able to make this thing work right. So uh, some other things that were important to me and, and why then I want to do this project is that um, uh, it, it's not necessarily a travel scope, as I say, but it, I want to be able to take this thing just about anywhere. And it's going to weigh, according to my modeling estimate, about 26 pounds when it's done and fit into a cube, um, not even a cube, but a it's bigger than a suitcase, but it, you know, it's something I could literally put backpack straps on and, and walk around with it that way. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so uh, this, this is what it looks like in, in theory. Um, some parts are actually built and uh, some parts are, are waiting, but uh, so it's going to be a, a 10 segrity telescope like my 12 and a half inch F5 is. I've got my head wrapped around that quite well. Um, it's going to have a 3D printed helical focuser, which I've already prototyped, and that seems to work quite well. The secondary holder is done. Um, and what I've done differently here was I put the center of gravity as close as I could to the axes of the spider vein um, because it's a big secondary. It's... it's uh, 120 millimeters minor axis, and um, it weighs a lot. And I, I really didn't want to be fighting it uh, tipping and tilting as I, as I push the telescope up and down. So I thought, I thought what could I do that, that might work here? And I started realizing, in fact, Jerry Ultion um, uh, was key to me actually being convinced that, by golly, um, if I tip and tilt this mirror the right way, I can do it out here at the rim instead of on the secondary itself. And what you see here, it, it's actually not quite right in my model yet, but you'll see an adjuster out here at the end of the spider vein. It's actually pointed 90 degrees in the wrong direction. This one should run horizontally 
and the one over here should be vertical and the one over here should be horizontal. And that'll allow me to pitch the mirror with this one in the back and rotate the mirror by using these two in conjunction. Um, and that, that should work at least in principle. Now, the fact is that I need to have something good and stiff. So these aren't, this isn't gonna be a, a, a wire spider and I'm okay with that, but um, you know, sheet of steel of some kind that I can cut and we'll see how it works. Do I need that fourth leg that everybody puts on their spiders? I'm not sure that I do. It's an experiment, we'll find out. So there you go. That's my three vein T spider. Um, so then finally, uh, yeah, it breaks down to a half meter by half meter by 0.3 meter box. There you see it all collapsed up and the tensegrity tent poles are gonna fit underneath here somehow. Um, so it'll all, it'll all fit in there at a weight of 26 and a half pounds if I do it right. And then maybe the, the second biggest risk after the mirror itself is the fact that I am going to require some spring balancing. And um, well, that's nothing new under the sun either. You just got to make sure you do it right. And uh, one thing I got to be wary, very aware of is that the center of rotation and the CG aren't so different that when you bring the CG over to near horizontal, it gets outside the footprint and the whole scope tips over. So I uh, wanna, wanna make sure that doesn't happen. Um, because I'll tell you what, some things have happened on this project and you're gonna hear about them. <laughs> Most of you probably know. So uh, now, uh, when I got started on this thing, um, I had a 16 and a quarter inch blank that I just to told you about that was um, made back in 1997 by Newport Glassworks. I think I paid about 300 bucks for it. It weighed about seven pounds. And well, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, that's a shame. But with every door that closes, another one or maybe two open. And I ended up buying a couple of, uh, actually three blanks and uh, Mel picked up one for me. So I, I got two myself and uh, they're nearly identical. I, I was trying to get the, um, the curvature the same and the, and the thickness. Well, it just, it, they, they just worked with uh, large, uh, thicker glass. So I said, okay, that's fine. Um, it'll weigh a little bit more. But what I ended up doing was um, going with a company called Display Optics Technologies, Inc., Doty, and they are located in um, uh, outside of Austin, Texas, just north of there. And they make very, very large slump blanks for the uh, aviation simulator business. So they're doing stuff that is uh, 10, 12 feet in diameter, um, that is sub, sub F1, uh, just deep, deep stuff. I, I, I actually got to visit there and um, their, their slumping molds look like giant woks. And I'm not kidding if they just had a handle on them, but they weigh several tons and they move everything around with forklifts and uh, the glass itself is a thousand pounds. So <laughs> it's an amazing operation. Polishing machines that are two stories tall and you gotta, you gotta walk up a flight of stairs just to get to the lap. So, um, big stuff. And they actually are, are um, now ready to address the astronomy market, um, especially for 30 inches and above. Um, but they see a, a 16 inch mirror as a challenge for them that will help, you know, inform the other technologies that they do, which is, which is why they were interested in doing it at all for me. So um, and I talked to this guy and uh, he, he looked at my slide and said, yeah, that's, that's good. I, I'm, I'm okay with you sharing it. So I've just outed this company, Doty. They are um, open for business, basically, if you want to get a slump blank. And uh, I'll tell you what, they come out really good. Here's, here's what I got. So um, as delivered, I, I got a 16 and a quarter inch mirror the slump radius was much shorter than I specified. And um, Doty is thinking about why that might be. Uh, and I, I don't really have much, many comments on that. I'm actually not disappointed in it because it meant that I had to grind it a little bit flatter. And the result is that I get a thinner edge. And I'd much rather have that than the other way around because I'm gonna center support this mirror and uh, when you do that, you know, the, the classic is a conical mirror that you would, you know, like a, like a Celestron C8. And you, you put the mass on the, in the center and let the edge get thin and 
uh, it ought to it ought to balance out quite nicely. So um, anyway, we're not talking a lot about a lot of change. The edge thickness has gone down to 0.425 inches, where it started out around 0.48 or 0.5, something like that. Um, so, and also uh, after grinding this thing, the, the uh, edge thickness is very uniform. I didn't touch the back, I just ground the front. And then I, I took an edge thickness measurement. It's, it's within a foul all the way around in four places. So um, that, that was very exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mentioned this phase two. Well, what about phase one? And well, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. So, um, did some annealing tests. So putting the, the blank in polarized light, uh, what I did here was I, I, have, my, I have a light table and uh, it's just, as, just a little bit bigger than the blank in one axis and a little bit smaller in the other. I bought myself some cheap polarizer to cover the thing and then um, put the, uh, the blank in between cross polarizers. And what I saw at first kind of worried me um, because it wasn't perfectly uniform. And then I started realizing what was going on. Uh, you notice here in the upper left picture, uh, some, some glowing edges at the uh, 45 degree positions. And you'll notice this black mark right here on the mirror. That's a Sharpie arrow to indicate the orientation of the mirror. I then rotated that 45 degrees and those glowing edges stayed in the same spot. And I said, oh, I think I know what I'm looking at. So I grabbed an eight inch BK7 lens and put that down in there and by golly, yep, I'm seeing what is called skew ray depolarization or simply a geometric rotation of the polarization as you go through a slanted and curved surface. And um, uh, it, the glass is perfectly homogenous. There's no birefringence in it, but you get a little bit of this out at the edges where uh, the, the slope of the, the glass is just high enough to rotate that polarization a little bit. And um, by a little bit, I mean like, you know, bright white, you know, an uncrossed polarizer would be as bright as this, uh, this edge down here, which doesn't have any polarizer on it at all. So, um, so that looks very good. And then in the meantime, um, this is actually the first test I did. I, I put the, the blank on its edge up against my, my computer monitor, which is why you don't see the whole blank lit up. And I, I saw this, um, this edge just light up in spades and I saw my handprint there. And I thought, oh my God, this stuff is not only birefringent, but it's got horrible thermal effects. And then I started looking at other pieces of soda lime and you know, there's actually nothing special about this soda lime. This is what soda lime does. And um, we know that we can make telescopes out of it. Up to, up to 25 inches fully coated and, and working beautifully and 30 inches and figured just fine. So um, I, I started calming down and then I realized that the, uh, that the mirror does not wanna be mounted on its edge. It wants to be mounted on its center. And once I did all that, then uh, all, of the, all of the stress induced uh, birefringence went away and what was left over was just that skew ray stuff. So. Um, I think this is, a, is quite a good uh, piece of glass, um, all three of them. And well, we'll see when I, when I get it all figured and put in a telescope, but um, no, no cause for concern. So there you go. All right, moving on. Um, built myself a tool, um, started grinding a pair of blanks and I got to flash polishing just uh, late last week. And although they're unequally polished, um, uh, east here has a uh, uh, more polished center. So this is a very bright spot. Um, although they're unequally polished, the figures are very close to each other. The focal lengths are identical. And um, so I'm quite excited to, to be at this state where I'm ready to really drive the polish in and then start figuring when I get there. Um, I don't really wanna bog us down with videos, but uh, I am happy to say that I now have a a Miromatic again, and that's put a lot more power into my strokes, and um, I can really put some weight on top of this thing and, and let her rip. So thank you. Um, this was uh, given to me by a fellow Rose City Astronomer Club member, Tim Havens. Thank you, Tim. And uh, 
close that and then get back to my Zoom. Please work, it worked in rehearsal last night. Oh no, there I am, okay. All right, so that was phase one. Uh, or I'm sorry, but what about phase one? Okay, here we go. So, uh, so I mentioned the ceramic mirror earlier and how I'm using that as a pusher and what that required to make it work was um, that I 3D print a ring to go around it, reinforce it with some steel twine and put some clips on it. And then what happens is the glass sits inside of this ring. I put a red foam rubber yoga mat, not shown here, in between the glass and the ceramic just to make sure I'm not you know, putting any real point pressures on it. And, um, and then put a nylon uh, insert in the center hex there and put the pin from the overarm in there and, and polish away. So that worked out quite well. In fact, um, that, that 3D printed thing got me from January until last week when it finally failed. And um, I'll, I'll give you an update on that. Uh, I found a different solution. But this, this really now gets into the, um, my, my journey <laughs> into this kind of a telescope. And I'll just let the laughter subside here before I continue speaking. Yeah, I wish, God, I wish I could hear you all laughing. Look at this. I started here in December and I went around, I got a spherical and then I started parabolizing it. And the next thing you know, I'm back where I started. And, you know, I, I've got it all in my blog and, I, and I, I've kind of gone back and looked, but I'm a little bit afraid to find out exactly what I did to go from here to here. But I know that next time I'm at this point, I'm being very much more careful than I was back in March. So, like I said, I'm kind of lost in the forest and, you know, boy, at one point I was getting a figure and I was like, hey man, it's the go figure. All right, anyway, moving on. Okay, these are some of the laps I used along the way. And uh, I started using a, a more of a classical um, pedal lap and doing some things to it until I was uh, really shown the benefits of the spider lap, which did work the best. And this is the last one that I used before I got that uh, horrible return to the beginning. So I don't know what I was thinking here, but it was wrong. So anyway, um, at, at the point where I was, where the mirror was spherical, um, I grabbed a lens. It's a, it's a big leftover from a head up display. And uh, I said, you know what? It might work as a Ross Null lens. And by golly, I think, I think it does. Um, it's, it's very finicky and, and not at all easy to use, but um, it did show me that I could get a uh, near, nearly spherical mirror, or sorry, not spherical, a nearly parabolized mirror to give me nearly straight bands. And that was very encouraging. Later on, I'm gonna show you the benefits of a, a Ross Null test uh, and, and the, um, and the problems with it. So my second figuring expedition um, was, was pretty epic because at this point now I had this thing and I, I didn't know what to do. I said, I wanna go back to sphere. And so as I work it back to sphere, I realize it's just a turned edge. And um, so I started polishing on my machine. I started taking measurements of how big the, the zonal uh, radius of this uh, or the zone width of the turned edge was. And I said, you know what, I can plot it on a chart and go, you know, starting at hour zero of polishing and, and see after the first couple of polishing rounds where, where I'll end up, you know, how long will it take to finish this thing? And by golly, it was a straight line <laughs> all the way out to about 36 hours to finish it and, and to get rid of the edge anyway. Um, what worked here was a, uh, a full aperture lap um, where I used a, uh, uh, a nylon screen that I, I picked up from uh, 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 a fabric store. Um, I think it's used in something like needlepoint or, or something like that. And uh, anyway, you can see the scale of it next to a, a dime. And that was great for pressing in these, these facets and just not worrying about channeling the lap, except just press them right in. Um, so then I, I got uh, from Elimination of turned edge. I wanted to get it to spherical. I used this lap. It took me all of six hours. Um, and I realized in the process of doing all this that since I was grabbing images with, the, with an astronomy camera, um, 
I, I just had, I had a record of everything that I had done and I thought, why not make a movie out of it? So here you go. As I work it, work that turned edge further and further out toward the edge of the mirror until it is just about gone and there it's gone. And then I worked on the hill and I watched that hill get smaller and smaller until the lines were just about straight. And at that point, I realized that uh, this would be a great opportunity for me to, to pause and um, start thinking about astigmatism and how I was going to mount this mirror. Um, you, you know, astigmatism is the bane of, of telescope mirror makers. And I wanted to see uh, what my mirror was doing. So early in the process, I had, I had built myself a... Um, a 3D printed housing that holds my ZWO camera, a big beam splitter, and a little laser diode that you can barely see the circuit board on right here. And the idea is you send a beam out, it bounces off the beam splitter, and um, it's an unlensed laser. So the beam just spreads out, covers the mirror, reflects back, comes back through the beam splitter, and um, at the wrong polarization, by the way. So only a little bit leaks through, which is great because then I'm not overexposing the camera. Um, and I can still see it in an eyepiece. In fact, there's an eyepiece sitting there. And this is what I was seeing and it looked horrible. And I thought, oh my God, I've got this, this nasty problem with astigmatism. And so I started rotating the mirror as you do. You know, you go zero degrees and then you go 45 degrees and then you go 90 degrees on clocking the mirror. And, and as I looked at it, it just wasn't making sense. And, and, I, and then I realized that, oh my God, it not only is, is the, the feature not really rotating, um, it really just depends on how I seat the mirror in that, in that test fixture. And it's all about, it was all about the test stand. It was absolutely all about the test stand. And so then I realized that I had to do the thing. I had to put my mirror on the ground and get up over it and mount that mirror so that it's balancing on its center of gravity and climb eight feet up in the air, <laughs> plus whatever the thickness of the mirror is, put my device up here on top of a ladder, get up there and look in the eyepiece and see that in fact, yeah, I was getting a nice circular diffraction pattern. And I was, and I was like, wow, this is awesome. I wish I could take a picture of it, but it was so, I mean, I don't like climbing ladders, you know, I'm not normally afraid of heights, but just, oh, it was not fun to be way up there trying to get this thing aligned and by the time I was done, I said, that's it. Okay, I know what I'm doing and I'm gonna figure it out later. And, and I did, and I'll get to it. But in the meantime, I said, okay, now that I'm at Spherical, I'm gonna design myself a mirror cell that is impervious to this edge support problem. And so the first thing I did was got out plop. And the more I played with it, the more it wanted to converge to a six point cell. I was like, no, I want nine. No, you want six, I kept saying. So I said, okay. Um, the fact that, that PLOP is an approximator when it comes to a, um, the actual physical shape of the mirror, it likes to have, what PLOP actually does, it assumes the backside is the, is the same shape as the front side, but runs the other direction. If you tell it, if you tell it, you want to curve back. That's what it does, and that was a surprise to me. Um, but uh, so I ended up going to Fusion 360, and and it roughly agreed, it, but it actually gave a little bit worse of an answer. And I, I said, well, okay, let, let's see what happens. So um, I built myself a test rig that had uh, six point features in it, and I. What I did was I put a nice sticky piece of tape on the center of the mirror and then wrapped that around the top of the frame and I hung the mirror from its center of gravity. And I, I highlighted that there that um, Dale Eason gave me the, uh, the inspiration to do that when he said torture the mirror. And, um, and so I did and the astigmatism was gone and now you can see that my out of focus images are very circular. Um, don't get misled by this, this funny shaped um, uh, uh, center obstruction. There's actually, as you see here, there's actually a piece of tape holding it on the mirror and that creates this, this funny bar. But uh, once I saw that and it didn't matter how I set it up, I always got a circle. I was like, okay, yeah, the test stand was the problem. So I said, okay, um, uh, clearly I'm gonna have to do better than gaffer's tape. 
And um, I think uh, you can see what's coming. I'm going to save it. <laughs> Let me explain this uh, flex balance wiffle tree uh, briefly here. Um, I stole this from somebody. I, I wish I knew who. Uh, but it works like this, is you have, you have your struts with your, with your pads on them, and then a, a fulcrum, which I used a finishing nail for, that just wedged between the strut and the frame. And here's a top view, and this is, this is a T-shaped strut with a, 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 you know, another strut coming off of it. And uh, this bar can just pivot on, around on that nail. And the yellow bar just twists freely so that you get this rotation. And it makes it appear that these guys are moving straight up and down. Of course, they're, they're moving in small arcs. But um, that works surprisingly well. And I built it. And here are some more detailed views. Um, you can see the, the finishing nails just wedged in there in all three places. I've got little 3D printed um, contact pads that, that have slots. So they just fit right over the, the struts. And then I put foam pads. This is part uh, pieces of yoga mat. Uh, just to take up whatever slot is in the uh, in the 3D print. And, and uh, the, the 3D print, by the way, um, I put in the spherical shape on the back of the mirror. And so all these pads have that section of sphere on them and they're oriented correctly. Uh, I still felt the need to put a, a foam pad there. So, and then of course you see this dangly thing hanging like a noose down the middle and um, Boy, if there's ever a way to hang yourself, it's, it's this. And this is what happened. So on July 4th, uh, skipping way ahead of myself, um, I was at a point where I was ready to star test. I, I thought the figure was that good that um, in order to inform me what to do next, I needed to be able to see something with the scope. And, and, and after, um, well, after that night, <laughs> I ordered two more. So, oh boy, it was, it was a, a sad night. Um, that was my fireworks show right there. Um, in fact, you know, so just brief aside here, this is, this is a project where you're ha handling a piece of glass that is, you know, nominally dinner plate thin, bigger than a serving platter or as big as a serving platter. And you're yanking it on and off a lap and you're putting it in and out of the tester and you're doing all this stuff to it the whole time thinking, God, my, my garage floor is made out of cement. This, this is not a good thing, you know? And I had visualized this mirror breaking over and over and over again. Every time I handle it, it's like, oh gosh, I hope I get to handle it again. That when it actually did rotate out of the telescope and just swung on its pendulum and hit the ground, I, you know, I was looking in the eyepiece when that happened and um, I hear this crash and I look down on the ground and I see broken glass. And the first thing I did was I looked back in the eyepiece. And it was just like, wait a minute. Oh, my God. Oh, it really is broken. Oh, man. I had visualized it so many times that the actual reality of it was still a visualization to me. There you go. All right. So the, the final figuring expedition before star testing, um, I went from spherical and started working it with a spider lap. And I, I only got so far where where then I started finding that the center wanted to hump up again. And, and at that point, I, I went back to a full contact lap and I dug myself a hole by just using a big giant W or, or I might've even just ran the, the edge of the lap uh, across the center a bunch of times and kind of smoothed it out a little bit with the W. And I got that to happen and it was like, oh, wow. I'm right back where I was in, in December of 20. <laughs> and, uh, but then it was like, okay, I saw Tom using the W stroke around this time. And, and it was like, we were neck and neck. And I was like, oh, oh boy, <laughs> who's going to win? <laughs> so Tom was using the W stroke. He said, I'm going to do that too. And I was able to get control over it. And things really started to come in. I started doing Mill La LaCroix, if that's pronounced right, uh, you know, tolerance tornadoes. And I could see this, this gray uh, as measured measurement get closer and closer to being in. And um, it just got very exciting. So um, it was unfortunately that I only missed it by that much. So anyway, um, this is getting very close to the end here. Uh, uh, 
I wanted to talk about Ronke gratings a little bit. In the process, I learned some things. I have a 65 line per inch grating and 133 line per inch grating. And at the time, there was a discussion going on our um, Oregon Scope Works uh, email server about Ronke gratings. And I, I thought, well, let's have a look. So at using a center of curvature test, it was interesting to see that a 65 line grating on an F3 mirror was giving me nice, clean, clear uh, Ronke grams. The 133 was like, oh my God, I'm actually getting diffraction on top of my uh, Moiré patterns. And it was, oh, this is, I don't like this. Um, then I, I set up my Ross null test again, this time using a Ronke grating instead of um, my uh, laser and beam splitter cube. And um, you'll see that the, the Ronke bands aren't straight, they, they kind of flare out and that's because this thing is off axis so much. But the 65 line grating um, it gives me um, kind of these broad and eh, I, you know, I can kind of tell that there's some zonal stuff going on in the middle, which I knew was there from this test on the, on the left. And then I put the 133 in and it was like, oh yeah, much, easier to read. And I, and I realized, oh yeah, that's why I got the 133 was for doing star testing or other tests where um, the mirror is actually focusing correctly. And uh, I thought that was worth noting for people. So I, I captured it and, and I'm sharing it here. So a um, little more on the, on the Ross Null test. Um, so I think, I think it's gonna be a great, a great test for with the high frequency grading uh, for looking at fine kinks, but uh, like, like any null test, um, uh, I, I just, I just don't want to trust it, especially not the way I set it up. I mean, look at this two by fours and, some, and deck screws and <laughs> a little bit of tape. Um, but, uh, uh, so I'll always use the star test as the, as the final answer. Um, so there you go a little bit on, on the Ross null. Um, oh, and, and, uh, for F3, boy, you need a big lens, uh, relative to your, the size of your mirror. Um, so it turns out I was able to procure an eight inch uh, circular lens and um, it's a little, uh, a little higher powered lens. So it can be a little closer to the source. And I think that's gonna work out just well, just fine. Okay, uh, like I said, I got a mirror matic Thank you, Tim. Um, and uh, some other things that worked out really nicely was my first time using uh, Hydrostone or Denscal plaster. Um, Hydrostone was unavailable. There's, you know, supply issues all over the world these days. So uh, Denscal proved to be a suitable alternative, at least for me. I, I don't know that it's any different than Hydrostone. I've never actually had Hydrostone. Easiest tool I ever made. You, know, you put your tiles down on your mirror, put, a, put a, a, a tape dam around your mirror using duct tape, pour your plaster all over the thing. And when you're done, You'll have a little bit of plaster um, getting in between some of your tiles, but in general, it comes out pretty much looking like this. And you start grinding, and my my gosh, when I was done with fine grinding, um, you can't really see them here, but it's nicely channeled. There's a, a good millimeter of uh, uh, depth between the plaster and the surface of the tile. So uh, that worked out really well. Um, Unfortunately, those paper pads that I bought from Got Grit just would not stick after polishing. I thought I got them down, I heated my tool, I got it dry and uh, stuck them down and I was really pleased to see them get stuck down. And I'm telling you, 15, 20 minutes into polishing, this is pretty much what I had. So I stopped that and that's where I am stuck after flash polishing, I need to make a pitch lap. And this is my last slide. So uh, a summary of lessons learned. Um, number one, do not turn your mirror into a pendulum bob. Okay. Uh, stop at spherical and test your mirror cell. I highly recommend this, especially for these thin uh, meniscus mirrors. Um, spider laps do work very well when you know what you're doing, but you gotta, you gotta pay attention. And I missed something and that caused me to go right back to where I was. The W stroke worked well too. And I'm just wondering uh, on these very thin mirrors, are, are we somehow taking advantage of flexible mirrors by, by the sheer virtue that we're working them with our hands, doing a W stroke and, and somehow 
bending in the, the shape we want as we polish. I, I don't know, but um, I, I was not, not encouraged before this that a W stroke would work on such a fast mirror. Um, Mel points out that you can avoid scratches by um, skipping some of the grits. And I did that and yeah, it's gonna take longer to polish. I don't know any scratches. I'm really pleased about that. Center support your thin mirror if you can. Um, I, I know that, we've, that they've been built with edge supports. Um, I, I really wanna do something different. And uh, so I'm gonna stick with that, that center support. And in fact, um, oh, I should back up a couple of slides. Uh, what Mel did when, after I broke my mirror, he made for himself on, I think on his 30, um, he put a wooden uh, post or wooden slat in here and bonded the center of his mirror to that thin piece of wood, which of course won't rotate like a pendulum and um, showed that by golly, yep, that works. So I'm gonna do something very similar. I'll come in with a, a piece of aluminum strap from the top, it'll be pop riveted in. And then I'll have a, a 3D printed puck on the back of the mirror into which this um, aluminum bar will insert somehow. I haven't worked out the details yet, but it needs to be removable and, um, and it needs to hold solid. So there's some exploration to do. Don't despair over a broken mirror and um, dense cal hydrostone, great stuff. Don't move your polishing machine into the spare bedroom. Oh, it might only apply to me. Um, uh, I like this uh, pressing channels with a plastic grid and doing it in a hot water bath, 150 Fahrenheit for my Google's uh, 55 that I'm using. Soda lime is stress sensitive, but get it fine annealed and don't let it bother you. Um, keep a log. And, and if you haven't been to my, my blog and, and you really want to have an eye-watering tour of figuring, um, go for it. <laughs> I warn you. <laughs> But it really kept me from going insane. Um, and using, using a cheap camera and capturing the images, oh boy, it's so much easier than trying to sketch something or remember or write down in words what it is that you saw last time. Um, and I'll tell you, I really need to learn how to make pitch laps the right way. I'm hoping uh, as soon as we're done with this conference, I can start picking some people's brains on that. I, I've read the books, I've read the websites, but whatever it is, I'm not doing it right. And, and I need some help. So please group, you've been great. And I thank you all for your help so far. And, um, and it, you know, keep, keep up the good work, everyone. As John Dobson says, there's nothing you can do while making a mirror that will lead to a life of woe. All right, thank you very much. I hope I have time for questions. I see there's, there, you're getting applause. Oh, cool, thanks. <laughs> um, okay, any questions out there? Uh, <clears throat> I actually have a comment. Um, uh, I broke, I, I tried to make two mirrors in my astronomy, you know, over the, over the years. I broke them both. I, I, now I, I have servo controllers. Here's our servo one right here. It didn't break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So go go to electronics, Rob. Uh, no. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. I know it, it, the, those um spin cast epoxy boy. Figure it out. That'd be great. So I have a question. You know, sure. you showed a few pictures of your mirror cell, the, mm -hmm. the torsion, the torsion uh, supports. Mm -hmm. Are are you planning on keeping those torsion supports and adding yes, and, and adding a center support as well, or will those torsion supports go away and the center support will be the entire thing? No, uh, it's going to stay the way it is. Um, I'm going to add. Uh, instead of a, a pendulum wire, I'm just going to add a, 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 a thin piece of aluminum on which the mirror will hang when it's nearly vertical. So this, this member that comes down will take the weight as instead of it sitting on the edges down here. Mm -hmm. 
So these things will, will go away. This, these are the things that will disappear. These guys, um, the six point flotation cell uh, will stay. And when the mirror is pointed straight up and down, then all of its weight will be loaded equally on these six points. And um, like I said, that seems to work quite well in the center of curvature test at spherical um, using the laser, I was able to very faintly make out a hexagonal pattern in one of the inner diffraction rings. And um, I don't know yet if, that if that's gonna be a problem. I felt that, oh, well, okay. When I'm in focus, it, it, it goes away. When I'm out of focus, there was this slight hexagonal shape and I thought, hmm, do I care? I don't think so. I'm going to give this a try. So uh, there are other ways to skin this cat. I can easily turn this into an 18 point flotation cell using the same principle because these guys are already um, torsion pendulum supports. I would just put triangles out here and they would, they would flex the way they needed to. Right. So, right. Okay. 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 Anyone else? No. Okay. Well, All thank right. you, Rob. Um, thank you. Yeah, I was one Actually, of those this who is... followed the. Oh, go ahead. Who, whoever that was. Oh, sorry. This is Mel. I was typing in a question. Uh, Rob, oh. would you say yeah. then that the two point at ninety degree separation edge support at the bottom uh, failed, or do you maybe think you didn't give that enough time to try? I, in my in my experience, it clearly failed, and I am just racking my brain as to why, in my case, it failed, and in other cases, it works. And there may be something I'm doing wrong there. Um, uh, so, but having fixed it with the the center support, um, I figured, you know what, I'm just going to do that. And if it works, it works. If it if it doesn't, and I believe it will. Um, well, if it doesn't work, then we'll talk. <laughs> But um, uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, precedent for center supporting mirrors, so why not? Yeah, we uh, center support all of our mirrors at Plain Wave for that reason. Right. So, so Dave, does that does that is it a similar concept to what Rob just described, where the center support is hanging, or is it the entire support of the mirror? So um, the smaller telescopes are simply mounted, the mirror is actually mounted on the center support without e any other support. And those are our conical back mirrors right. up to the 24. And we still get by with it with the 24, but that's the limit. Um, we've done a lot of FEA and solid works uh, regarding this. Anyway, for the 700, which is what, 28 inches, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we had to go to an 18 point cell, but it's still, the, the radial support is still from the center. And um, in the one meter, we uh, do the same thing. It's also an 18 uh, uh, point support. The, the way that you capture the mirror in the center is really, really important. You have to decouple the the axial motion with the radial motion. There's a hell of a lot to it. And I think after 20 years, we're still um, discovering um, pieces of the puzzle. Not so easy. Well, I'm, I'm encouraged and, and a little bit scared by what you said, Mr. Rowe. Um, luckily, I'm not doing this on a uh, Schmidt or on a Cassegrain or a Rowe Ackerman or whatever it is you guys make. Um, uh, my, hopefully my tolerances will be forgiving, but uh, uh, I don't have the um, machining capabilities that you guys do. And well, if this works at all, I'm going to be quite happy. <laughs> so, well, uh, you know, cool. the meniscus mirror is a very, very interesting development, but it's probably the hardest thing you could manage to pick for a first telescope project. Uh, well, it's not my first, thank God. I've done a number of them, but uh, it's my first meniscus, and I don't know where else you'd start from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to do a meniscus, you just go right for it. You just got yeah. to do it, yeah. You got to yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Well, thanks again, Rob and, and Dave for, the, for those insights. That's helpful. Um, why don't we uh, go into you and Russ talking about your update on precision astrometry. Astrometry, right. Photocenter astrometry, astrometry or whatever. I'm going to let Russ uh, start this talk and introduce the subject with a little bit of uh, background and science and why we, why we want to do it from a science point of view. Over to you, Russ. Russ, you're muted if you're trying to talk to us. I'll unmute and let me get the... Uh... Okay. Let me get the... Almost there. Okay. And let me share the screen. Okay, that working now? Yep, we got you. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, uh, two plane wave telescopes that uh, we'll be talking about briefly. Their location in Chile, uh, not far from the CTIO and the eight meter Gemini telescope. And uh, at any rate, the uh, talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the facilities and science organization. Dave's going to talk about the photocenter astrometry, and Rick is going to talk about speckled photometry. So each about 10, 15 minutes. And uh, oh, this was a, and we had a workshop uh, down at Dave's uh, Pinot Valley Observatory's little cabin there uh, that we call Roville. At any rate, it was uh, uh, Rick and Jonah, myself, uh, Dan Gray, and Dave's taking the uh, photograph there. And uh, the first thing we did was uh, work on on some fundraising. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> that's uh, Dave's pickup. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> that's uh, I think that's Dan there and Rick. They're, they're panning for gold and. Uh, it got a little bit, but it wasn't very much. We decided, you know, it was too small scale. So we went looking for, uh, okay, let's, it is an advance. There we go. Now oh, it's advancing. Uh, so we <laughs> found this uh, abandoned uh, gold mine. Uh, Dave, you think it was built in the 70s or maybe the injury. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can, get it going again, maybe we could raise the, the money we need for this. Uh, no, but uh, seriously, so the uh, <laughs> science programs uh, that were, we have been working on some of them and we want to work on others. So uh, it's all uh, about binaries and uh, using speckle interferometry so we can uh, get small separations and, and short periods. And so you, you can kind of break down the targets into known binaries, the uh, six orbit catalog. So 
we can look at things less than five arc seconds. Wider than that, uh, other techniques can handle it. Uh, and so these ones already have orbits that you refine the orbits and can handle some of the problems. Uh, a sec category is they aren't published as known binaries yet, but they have uh, either a few or many past observations recorded in the Washington Double Star Catalog. And uh, so you can kind of decide, you know, would making another observation uh, really add to it? So eventually they could become a, a known binary. And then this third category is there aren't, it's not a known binary. There's no past reported observations except for a Gaia and maybe a two mass occasionally. And so the idea here is if we add uh, another speckle observation, and if it's larger than one arc second, we can also use past data from Eukert and Panstar. So we can add three observations. Maybe we can determine if there's a curve to it. So, you know, and if it's curving, then it's probably a, a gravitationally bound binary. And uh, what we use for that, Dave downloaded, I think what took five days or so, Dave, the whole Gaia catalog. It and, took three weeks, I think. Oh, yeah. three weeks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and at any rate, he developed a, a, a double star catalog from that. And we use that. He has a nice tool to use. And, uh, and that works very well. Now, Gaia kind of runs out of steam around uh, six tenths of an arc second. So if you want to go beyond that, you can't use Dave's Gaia catalog to find it. So to, to look for possible... <coughs> Uh, new binaries, uh, you could look for elongation. And we're, we're doing some thinking about that. It looks looks like the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory, when, the, when it gets going, that they'll be able to see elongations down to uh, maybe just a, a tenth or so of a uh, uh, arc second. So that'll give us hints of which ones to look at. Uh, a, the superluminous red dwarf branch, is another place where is they're likely uh, the two stars cause it to jump up on the HR diagram. And uh, so they're likely to be binaries. And then if you want to do red dwarfs and white dwarfs, uh, it's kind of between the red dwarf branch and the white dwarf branch. But if, uh, and so we can get a resolution on the one meter telescope in Chile down about Two tenths of an arc second, and uh, but if you want to have resolution better than that, you have to go beyond speckle. And so uh, uh, Dave's going to talk about uh, uh, photocenters and where where photocenter works well, as he'll explain. With if you have uh, a a brighter star and one that's real faint, so we can look at really late white dwarfs that are essentially invisible or neutron stars, or maybe in stellar black holes, if there's any close enough for us to, to uh, look at. So here's the telescopes we have. The uh, Barrow is uh, Pat Boyce's one in east, about 40 miles east of San Diego. It's a, a CDK-17, and uh, it's got the camera and the filters there. Uh, Firo's my telescope. It's been moved to Arizona. It's uh, been upgraded to CDK 12.5. Uh, and then there's two uh, CDK telescopes uh, in Chile. And uh, these are the cameras. Uh, other telescopes, we've been doing speckle on the 60 inch telescope on Mount Wilson. Uh, we're planning on four nights in June. And I want to get uh, going on the Bach 90 inch at Kitt Peak. And Howard, you made observations there, right? Yes, I have, um, as, as have Dan. Uh, we and eight other people had one night on the 90 inch, I think in 2011. Yeah, that's and, pretty uh, nice telescope, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's real nice, all right. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but anyway, I'm gonna try to set that up. Uh, this is Dave's GDS catalog and uh, so here you can see the main sequence. Uh, if you, can you see my arrow? At any rate, so there's, there's the super luminous uh, red dwarf branch and here's the uh, white dwarf branch. And here you can see a bunch of stars between, between them. So at any rate, 
Uh, and Dave made a sub catalog very cleverly. He just drew a rectangle around the superluminous branch. In, and so we have a catalog of, of superluminous uh, red dwarfs, many of which might be uh, binaries. So uh, target selection, uh, we use the GDS and uh, the access tool. The uh, observations, uh, the software uses is SciTech CAM and uh, it runs the cameras and the telescope. So SciTech CAM is, is uh, what the software Dan Gray developed. And then for uh, reduction, we use a bispectrum analysis program that Dave developed. And so that's, that's our software, which of course is really critical. And then personnel, uh, so taking care of the facilities, Pat does Barrow, I've taken care of Pyro. Uh, uh, Matt, the plane wave and, and the OBSTEC, you know, kind of handled the, the telescopes down in Chile. Uh, for operations, uh, Sophia and Nat now do the run speckle on, on Pat's uh, uh, telescope. So he doesn't have to mess around with it. And, uh, uh, Ivan and Sophie are going to run it for FIRO. And the, Dave, you want someone to run speckle down on your on the plane wave telescopes in Chile, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to need the, the software, as I mentioned, Dan and Dave handle. Uh, we've got instructors. Uh, this is supposed to be Ivan's missing an eye. Sophia, Rachel, Kalei. I'm going to come back this uh, uh, late winter and spring and in, in do some teaching. Uh, the students, uh, we have the Stanford Online High School. We're picking up a bunch from Antelope Valley. That's a, around Lancaster. And uh, uh, we've had students for quite some time from Evergreen College. And then uh, right now things are real time, access real time, and we're working on automating it. So we're gonna add to Dan's software. And uh, Ivan, uh, Rick and I are working on, on what it would take to uh, uh, add a little program that will do the uh, selection of things and kind of automate things. Okay, that's, that's uh, and uh, so Dave, over to you, let me stop sharing. All right, well, um, sure is wonderful to be here. The Altaz initiative has had a major impact on my life. I, um, I learned a lot from all of you and a lot of the conversations I had led to some great ideas, which, you know, some of them got incorporated into plane wave telescopes and elsewhere. So uh, this has been a very useful um, workshop for me. And um, this subject that I'm about to tell you a little bit about is really, it's got a lot to it. So, um, and I'm going to run through it uh, very fast. So what am I doing? I'm sharing, let me move this to here. So I'm going to run through it pretty fast because there's quite a lot to talk about. I, I see that, I don't see Rick uh, Wasson on the uh, Zoom session, unless there's more to it than I have here. I still don't see him. So I'll just keep going until uh, Rick comes or we um, run out of time. So the can you see my screen with uh, plate solve on it? Make sure I've got this thing. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So I'm sure many of you um, know about plate solve. Uh, it's one of the several um, programs out there that allows you to input an image and match it with a catalog of stars. And this is my version of it. It's been around for a long time. So we can go to plate solve. We can plate solve this image in front of us. It takes a second or two and um, there's the match. So all of the yellow circles are where 
catalog stars got matched with actually from uh, with uh, extracted stars um, on the image. So if we zoom in on that a little bit, we can take a look at what that means. So the the um, extracted star, I think, yeah, extracted star is the red cross. The catalog star is this cross. And the fact that it has a yellow circle around it means that it got matched. So that's plate solve. And it's um, pretty accurate. For instance, the, um, the image scale here was 0.2 arc seconds per pixel. And the average residual, and this was matched to Gaia catalog, the average residual is less than 0.2 arc seconds RMS. So um, not bad at all. You got to appreciate that there's optical distortion. Um, every telescope has it. So you have to also calculate the third order and higher order distortion in the image. And there's coma and astigmatism and lots of stuff that you have to worry about. So let's uh, turn off the iconography. So um, it's kind of amazing already. You have a 0.2 arc second, uh, less than a 0.2 arc second residual. Okay, but it gets more interesting than that here in a minute. Um, let me start my talk. So Russ and I got interested in how well you could actually do with plate solving. And I don't know how it actually, you know, everything is a bunch of kicking stuff around uh, between people. I don't remember <laughs> how the idea came about, but Russ went off and fan, after we had talked about it, Russ, Russ went off and found a paper that got me very intrigued. It was from CTIO and their 0.9 meter and they had uh, used plate solving techniques to actually track the photo center of a binary star. So what do we mean by that? Well, if you can see, I don't know if you can still see me up here in the corner. If we've got a pair of stars rotating around each other, orbiting, then if they have unequal masses, the photo center um, usually moves. It's a complicated piece of business. You got to calculate uh, the total flux, you got to assume it's a main sequence or whatever, and on and on. But it, that orbiting motion will cause the center of the luminous uh, image to move back and forth with the period of the uh, binary. And um, we've recently had a lot of very nice technical advances in imaging, the biggest one is probably um, the CMOS camera revolution. Um, CMOS cameras are, in, in my estimation, far better in every aspect than CCDs. The, uh, except perhaps the pixels are pretty small. And so if you've got a very short focal length in instrument, um, you know, you may not have, okay, so there, there's some trade-offs with pixel size and so forth that I won't get into, but um, they're beautiful cameras and we've got great filters now and um, we've got telescopes that automatically track and you can program ro them robotically to do a night's work for you while you sleep and so forth. So we have an opportunity here uh, for small telescopes, uh, I'll show you an example from Scott Dixon. I know he's actually online. Yeah. So uh, we got an example from Scott's uh, eight inch RC that actually shows promise after we work out some, you know, details. There's lots of lots and lots of details here for doing some very interesting scientific work um, using an eight inch um, RC and a good CMOS camera. So what can we do? Well, if we have patience and we can, which I don't have a lot of, and we can um, keep track of, of stuff on the computer, which I don't do well 
at all either. We can, over a period of you know, a few months or e maybe even several years, we can actually watch the motion of the photocenter of a binary. And that doesn't mean that we can calculate the orbit yet, but we can actually know it's a binary. And then there's other techniques that we can add to it that we could calculate the orbital characteristics of that binary. So scientifically, why is it valuable? Well, um, as I said, two, unequal, two, two stars of unequal masses will show a, a, a mo will show motion. And it's really one of the best ways, perhaps, to find uh, main sequence stars that are orbiting black holes or neutron stars that are orbiting black holes and so forth. And these unusual cases are hard to detect by other met methods. And you could do spectroscopy, but spectroscopy is quite um, time consuming, it requires very large apertures and lots of integration time. So we, we really fit here in a way where we can detect some interesting objects that are um, difficult for other techniques. Okay, so the idea is to take a sequence of images. Let's say we take 30 images in a row, 30 second integrations each, which I do on the 24 inch in Chile. And um, I turn, I plate solve those images. I identify the stars by doing a match. And then I combine the centroid locations of each of the stars on each of the images to make what I call an observation, which is the average centroid location in those 30 images. Then I, can, I call it an observation for lack of a better word. And then the next night or a week later or a month later, I can go back and take that same set of images at the same location in the sky and see if anything moved. And that's the idea. At the same time, we can use the same plate solve information to detect elongation. Well, if you've taken images with a telescope, you'll know there's lots of reasons that stars get elongated um, that have nothing to do with them being a binary or a double. And so what I have to do is to remove the kind of what I call the average elongation, which actually changes as a function of the uh, location on the image. So I actually have to do a two-dimensional polynomial least squares fit to remove the <clears throat> average elongation that's caused by other things besides a being a double star. And then look for um, stars or PSFs, actually blobs that stand out as being elongated kind of like all by themselves, okay? after you remove this uh, average elongation. So we just saw a plate solve and we saw how we can extract stars and match them. And then I have a tool that allows us to, for each one of the images in a folder or a whole collection of folders, the plate solve will automatically plate solve each of the images in those folders and will present the results to you as a CSV file that gets kind of automatically placed in your folder. And this is an um, example of that CSV file. So there's a bunch of stuff that we get from the average properties of the image, and that's all up here. And then we get individual, we get the results for the individual stars um, in this particular image. So we have X and Y centroids, we have um, matched RA and DEC, this is the plate solve match, uh, the total signal count in ADUs, and so forth. Uh, 
nothing much of interest here, perhaps, except I assign it a Gaia DR2 data release to serial number. So we can go track it down again. And that's very important. If I want to then average the centroid locations, which is the next step, I have to uh, know what star it is in my catalog. Okay. Then we turn those plate solved C CSV files. We can make an observation, what I call an observation out of them. And there's a lot of stuff that we can diddle around with. Um, and most of it is about the criteria that we use for uh, yes. making it a- Maybe 20 minutes here and be finished and we can- Hello? Yeah. Um, Russ, can you mute your microphone? Mm -hmm. We've been asked to play Tina. Russ. Hello, oh, Russ. Good. <laughs> I'd like to be Left. Okay. Russ, you got to mute your microphone. Oh, okay. 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 So where are we? So we take those 30 images now that we're plate solved and we make an observation out of them by doing some statistical stuff like averaging and finding um, standard deviations. And so again, here's the uh, serial number, the, the plate solved uh, information, um, an SNR estimate and so forth. The, the interesting columns perhaps are these two. This is the what's called the standard error in the mean position. So if I have 30 measurements of a star's location, I can ask, well, what's the standard deviation of that? And then if I divide by the square root of the number of observations, I get what scientists call a uh, standard error. And that is the standard error. So this would tell you roughly how much uh, precision there is in the measurement itself. And you can see we're down in the two to, you'll see a graph in a second. We're down in the kind of like the two to 10 milli arc seconds over that 900 second integration, which is the 30 images, 30 um, second uh, exposures. Okay, so um, I had a kind of a hard time believing this at first. I went over and over it again, but I'm now totally sure, even though the pixel scale is, so I know that everybody's going to wonder, well, your pixel scale is 0.2 or 200 milli arc seconds per pixel. How on earth do you claim that you're doing two milli arc seconds or one hundredth of a pixel um, resolution? Um, well, or noise. Well, what happens is, is that you've got a lot more information in a pixel than you think you do. You've got the intensity of that pixel and you've got the intensity of, you know, hundreds of pixels surrounding it that go into the uh, calculation of the centroid. And that's why you can do that. And I've written code to do the noise analysis, you, you know, putting everything into it. And sure enough, this is quite close to what you expect um, from the, just the noise alone. So uh, that's very interesting um, to begin with. Th there's plenty that I don't understand at all. So I'm gonna do a lot of apologizing for not um, understanding what I'm doing yet, but you know that's the way it is when you start something new. So that's the SEMP. Uh, that's that's a very encouraging result, uh, I would say. Um, let's talk about the residual elongation. Well, if I sort this list, which I'll show you maybe in a second. Yeah, did I do that? here? Yes. So I sorted the elongation. It turns out the first one is um, not a double. It's a bad centroid. It's bad centroiding. It's actually two clearly separated stars that were taken as one when I centroided it. 
But the second one turned out to be this guy. And um, this thing is clearly elongated, even visually. The elongation is 95 milli arc seconds. And um, I don't know if you can see it, but I've looked at enough images in my life that this is clearly elongated relative to the stars that are around it. And if I bring up plate solve again, and I go, I know where it is because I've looked at it so many times, it's right there. So if we go in and we look at, there's the round stars that are around it and there's the little elongated bugger. And um, I don't know what makes it show up the best, but it's certainly elongated. And we can use uh, photometry, astrometry tools to show that it has a considerably higher elongation than the stars around it. So, and this isn't in a double star catalog. So this is presumably a new star. And this was a completely random field that I, I just decided to take 15 hours RA and uh, minus 30 deck just to make it easy to remember. And um, so I think probably any field that you took will have a few, maybe one, two, three, who knows. But I think on the average, we probably get at least one um, candidate to go off. And then we could use speckle to see if we could resolve that guy. And I would be willing to bet with a one meter, we could at least see that it you know, to, to, guarantee, to, to show, demonstrate um, unequivocally that it was in fact a double. All right. So that's interesting um, for discovery reasons. Back to photo center. Here I've plotted the uh, SEMP. That's again, the standard error in the mean position in milli arc seconds versus the Gaia uh, GMAG. GMAG is just the kind of V-band uh, magnitude. So even down to 16 mag stars, you know, we're getting um, six milli arc second uh, kind of average uh, SEMP. If you draw a line through this, if you go to the really to actually you go to the bottom of this, that is the curve that you actually expect from a Monte Carlo noise analysis of this problem, amazingly enough. So we're kind of, we're getting very close at least over 900 seconds to getting to the uh, noise limit of a measurement with a 24 inch telescope and 900 seconds of integration time. However, and this is um, embarrassing because I don't understand it. Leon um, put together, Leon's an incredibly bright um, university student now, 18 years old, and he's been helping me take um, the images and we've been doing data reduction together and so forth. Um, if you, so we took um, that same, um, region of the sky, we did four observations and they were separated by some amount of time. It was over a period of a few hours. And so it wasn't totally sequential. Um, and this is what we have so far. So here's 40, this, these, this grid is 40 milli arc seconds. It's actually um, 2.2 micro radians. That's how he did it. Leon did this graph for me. And the arrows represent, so zero is where the Gaia star is, zero, zero. That's the Gaia coordinates. And they're not necessarily correct perfectly either. Um, so you got to take that into account. But you see there's this general trend there's a correlation in the error between RA and DEC. Sorry, this is RA and this is DEC. And I just saw this this afternoon about five o'clock. And 
it's a it's a real head scratcher but it has to do i'm sure with the selection of plate solve stars and not rejecting the plate solve stars that i should so imagine let's go back to an image now this is pure conjecture at this moment in time so um I could change, I, I uh, reserve the right to change my mind completely about this, but these images have varying degrees of coma and astigmatism. This is a CDK 24, the corrected Dow Kirkham of my design. So it's got really good optics out to the edge of the, out to the corner of the field, but nonetheless, stuff starts to happen. Now look at that. So. You know, when you plate solve that, what do you actually take as the centroid of this blob? You get the idea. There, there are lots of things that happen in images, especially out towards the edges and corners that, you know, reduce the accuracy of the um, technique. This corner is pretty good. Huh? I'll take a look at this corner. This corner is quite good too. Well, it's got a little different diffraction pattern, but it's not bad. So you get the idea. Um, you know, should we throw away the plate solve stars? In other words, the stars that I use in the fit, should I throw them away out here? Should I throw them? Maybe I should only keep stars. Maybe I should only keep stars that are right close to the center. I don't know yet. And I don't, I certainly don't understand this trend line at all. I have no idea at the moment what's going on. Okay. Now, let me bring up Scott's results because he found something quite interesting. Where did I put his presentation? There it is. Um, this is Scott Dixon. He's online with us. Um, he has an eight inch RC and a CMOS one of these beautiful CMOS cameras. So he observed a field, they were 60 second exposures and so forth, no filtering, basically just a wide band luminance filter. Um, uh, 60 images per observation. So a total integration time of, um, what is that, an hour? total observation time of an hour per observation with an eight inch telescope. And he did it um, on August 9th and August 11th. And he also did it on June 11th and August 11th. So he took an observation on June 11th and then on August 11th, and he compared them. He also compared two nights, I think, of the two of August. So anyway, let's take a look at what we got. So this is the change in the star position over two nights, the ninth to the eleventh. And this is um, in milli arc seconds. So you can see that he's got a grouping between night to night. Now this is over two nights. So you know, lots of things can change over two nights, but he's got a pretty tight little grouping there, about 10 milli arc seconds, which is totally amazing to me for an eight inch RC. However, if we look from June 11th to August 11th, we now see a really different picture. We see a huge blob with this a uh, trend line, which is reminiscent of the one I just showed you. So um, I don't know if that means anything or not. And we have to go investigate. But um, so why, you know, what on earth happened? I mean, here's two, two different nights, two days apart. Uh, and here's uh, two nights, uh, two months apart. Well, I don't see any particular reason to expect that they would be dramatically different over two months. Obviously, the star positions themselves didn't change in two months. If they changed, they would have changed milli arc seconds, some number. 
most of them. I mean, you might expect some binaries, but not like this. This isn't reasonable at all. Um, so I asked him to, so we did an, uh, plate solve has a facility within it to analyze the images themselves. So we loaded up some images from June 11th, August 9th, and August 11th. And I ran the image analysis uh, feature of plate solve. And basically what it means, what I'm looking at here is the color represents the RMS diameter. And the, um, these, these lines represent the elongation magnitude and direction of the star. So what we see is very clear now. We see that on August 9th and 11th, the focus and the calibration were quite similar to each other. The, it did what a, every RC does. You know, an uncorrected RC doesn't have a flat focal surface. It has a curved focal surface and it has off-axis astigmatism, which changes depending on whether you're inside or inside of focus or outside of focus. So it switches direction by 90 degrees. And you can clearly see that behavior here. When, when you're focused like this, the elongation is primarily radial and that's just the normal off-axis astigmatism that you get in an RC. And when you're focused correctly, or sorry, well, I said that badly. When you're focused in the other direction, you see the astigmatism has now changed to um, azimuthal astigmatism. So in my opinion, um, the difference between this and this is simply due to a dramatically different um, focus position for the camera. Okay. Scott um, did a lot of work here. Uh, he plotted uh, where these are on the image, these outliers, and he called he he labeled them from T1 to T11. So remember that there's T6 and T11 here, and remember that T1 through T10 is here without T6. And we'll go take a look at where those guys are on the on one of these typical images. Um, <laughs> six and 11 are here and the other buggers are way out here. Okay, you're gonna ask me why. Well, I don't know yet uh, why, <laughs> but thanks to Scott for a, a, a lot of work and a very interesting um, uh, little presentation. I mean, th there's many, many hours worth of work in head scratching um, regarding this. So. Let me, let me summarize. And uh, I don't see uh, Rick, so we can continue with questions after this if there are any, or we can just move on to something else or whatever, you can go to bed. You know, I think that Photo Center um, studies are a really a promising and interesting area for small telescopes. We have the we, we have the telescope time and we have, uh, some of us have the patience and organization to actually do this right. It might not be me, but I bet there's other people out there. And we've just started. This is a interesting and long um, field where we can do a lot with hardware. We can have nice flat <clears throat> fields that are well corrected over uh, a large area. We can make opti optical designs like that. We can work on having good uh, consistent focus. That's gonna be a huge um, um, thing to, to look at here. And we can work on you know taking images with consistent air masses, uh, being careful with our filters and many other things, good tracking in telescopes. Um, and so forth. And in software, you know, I already see uh, lots of work in how you extract the um, centroids. The, my, my centroid calculation 
is probably not as good as it could be for this work. And we certainly have a lot of work to do in how to select plate solve stars. You want to, you certainly want to get rid of plate solve stars that had problems for whatever reason. They might in themselves um, be poorly centroided. You want to throw those out because you don't want to use anything as a plate solve star that has any problem to it at all. And I haven't yet been careful about that and so forth. Okay, and I thought, I hope that was um, understandable in some way. And we, I'll take questions now if you, anybody has any. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> hey, Dave, um, do you do anything with disper dispersion at all based on the altitude? Well, that's going to raise its ugly head, too. If you're not pointing at the z zenith, then you have atmospheric dispersion, which is a function of the filter and the color temperature of the star. So, yes, you've got to be careful about that, too. Dave, All right, uh, great. Yeah. But the question, so on, it sounds like focus could be really important. How do you think you can get really good, consistent focus? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. I think we probably focus at the center of the image using the best few stars we have very near the center. I mean, we wouldn't want to use a broad field focus like I do in, um, in whatever tool I wrote for that, however long ago it was. Um, the autofocusing thing is probably not the way to do it. It's good for astrophotography to focus kind of over a, a average focus over the whole field of view. But I think now we probably want to focus our attention on the center of the field of view. Uh, I don't know. I ha there's a lot to think about. We're just at the very kind of early stages of this. Anybody else? Yeah, David, just, just to reiterate why, why this type of research is important. Uh, my understanding is that the more double stars that are measured and have their orbits established accurately, um, that enables astronomers to be able to calculate their true masses, which helps constrain um, uh, what uh, what stellar theory says about what, how stars are yeah. in, in actuality. Is, is that a good summation or did I, did I miss something? Yeah, that's um, as good as, I mean, if, as a simple explanation, we we know a lot about stars and stellar evolution um, from measuring double stars. It's almost the only way to get a real mass um, out of uh, an observation. So that's very important. Um, and also I like, uh, I always think of Bob Layton who I knew fairly well at Caltech. And he always said, well, if you start to look for something you're bound to find something interesting. It doesn't matter where you look. If you look in a place where nobody's looked before you'll probably find a lot of things that are curious and interesting. And he was always right. You know, he started millimeter wave astronomy and blah, blah, blah. He, he, he was like that. So we have one question that just came in on the chat. Uh, Greg asks, uh, is this sensitive to camera tilt? <laughs> the answer is I'm sure it is. I don't know how much. So <laughs> right. it's, I think it's going to be sensitive to everything, but I can't put a, you know, a number on it. Obviously, if you have off-axis astigmatism, then uh, pretty much anything that you do, if you move the collimation center a little bit or if you tilt it a little bit, you're going to change the, the blobs. If you have off-axis coma, uh, like in um, conventional SCT or something, or in a Newtonian, an uncorrected Newtonian or prime focus instrument, then that coma is going to change if you're off collimation or if you're 
tilted. So I, I'm sure everything is going to make a difference and it's going to depend on each individual situation. All right. Okay. So, Thanks so one, one last question from, yeah. from me here, Dave. Um, okay. So you, you talked about, you know, how surprisingly uh, good the data was collected from the eight inch RC. Mm -hmm. Do you, from that, would you guess a, what a, a minimum aperture would be to do useful measurements like this? An eight inch. You wouldn't, wouldn't go any smaller. Well, would you? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know either. I mean, the, I, don't, I don't know. The noise just goes up. I have a noise calculator that we could check, but what you'll find is you're just going to have to integrate longer to hmm. beat down the noise. Now, you may, we may not have to get anywhere near the, the noise limit to have useful observations. I mean, suppose the noise level was 20 milli arc seconds RMS. Uh, and, and that's still amazingly good. And you could track the photo center if it were moving, you know, 100 milli arc seconds, which I'm sure a lot of interesting stuff will be doing. So a little six inch refractor or even smaller might. Um, be quite useful if you're willing to integrate for, you know, longer periods of time. Yeah. The, the big glass has the advantage of, you know, capturing more photons so that drop beats the noise down. Right. Uh, I was thinking of all those people out there who have these beautiful four inch refractors on these really expensive, very accurate mounts. And right. you know, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of cameras hooked to them right. that are taking um, you know astrophotos, you know, that you know, perhaps with a change of, uh, of of direction, they might be able to make some really useful contributions to this. Yeah, well, it's pretty simple to figure out what would happen if I go from an eight inch to a four inch. Um that's uh, one fourth the aperture, but it's only one half the noise if the noise is from, say, sky background. Um, if the noise is from read, we found that the read noise isn't very, isn't all that important. So these CMOS cameras that have low read noise are also great for smaller apertures too, um, for the obvious uh, SNR reason. So if you, um, are willing to, so Scott got from night to night, he got 10 milli arc second, um, uh, roughly RMS uh, change over those two nights in August. And if that was dominated by noise, then the noise would only go up a factor of two. You go from an eight inch to a four inch because it goes like the square root of the number of photons you collect. So you're in the 20 milli arc second range with a four inch telescope and a one hour observation of one field. And, you know, my goodness, that could be quite useful if it were combined with other people's observations or you did it from over a period of a year or two and you, you know, had, had the intelligence to organize the data correctly. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities here. Russ, do you yeah. have any further things to say about that? Uh, no, except that, you know, uh, we were talking about, you know, estimating mass. So uh, the masses of, of uh, red dwarf, particularly late ones, aren't well known. But in some of the astronomers I've talked to, there's some real theoretical arguments about the masses of uh, neutron stars and also stellar black holes. So if, if this happens to uh, work well enough so we can do uh, discover some neutron stars and binary systems, that would be a, a major, uh, uh, major input to science. Very good. We just got a, um, a chat message from Richard saying that in his talk on Friday, he'll describe a 40 milli arc second uh, in 10 minutes with his EV scope, which I think is a four inch telescope, if I remember right. Yeah, that's yeah, impressive. 114 huh? millimeters. Uh, I mean, EV scope is doing everything wrong. It's got coma, the uh, sensor is a uh, Bayer array, um, <clears throat> and, um, uh, you know, there's visible coma in the images. 
But, um, you know, observations of um, Barnard star, uh, you know, 27 days apart, um, show approximately the correct motion and your observation uh, stuff shows about 40 milliarc seconds um, in a 10 minute observation. That's amazing. So there you go. I mean, there is yeah. there is work to be done here and the bigger the scope, uh, presumably the better, but you know, only if you have optics that are up to it, tracking and optics and so forth that are kind of up to it. And focus. Yeah, well, it's, it's the scope I got. That's why I've been using it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's Richard. Richard will uh, plow the depths of whatever he's got in front of him. <laughs> <yep>. <laughs> the right thing to do. Um, I had a, a quick question. Well, maybe it's not so quick. Um, so uh, you were, you've been talking about black holes. And um, I don't know how many black holes we've discovered as, as humanity um, in our galaxy, other than, you know, the, there's always central black holes in galaxies. But what are the possibilities? I mean, this could be a pretty huge thing for discovering black holes. Uh, does yeah. you want to make some predictions? <laughs> Prediction. <laughs> yeah, we oh. want to hold you to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think Russ is better at this game than I am. Yeah, I so, so the... There have been, uh, you know, kind of the question. These are stellar black holes, of course. So these, these are you know supernovas that were quite massive and and couldn't stop at the neutron star and went to a black hole. And so there's theoretical estimates of the frequency, you know, it kind of their their uh, density in space, and uh, uh, you know, but it's quite uncertain. So if we can uh, have an observational technique that even just detects a few uh, stellar black holes, uh, it will help tighten things up. Even, even a white dwarf and a red dwarf together actually has a lot of uh, astrophysical um, interest. Yeah, and one of the things that's cool about the photocenter is now, of course, the white dwarfs, as they age, uh, get redder and redder, but they get really, really faint too. So even with large telescopes, at some point you can't see uh, image of the white dwarf anymore. The red dwarf stays nice, nice and re reasonably bright and relatively bright. Uh, but with the photo center, if, you know, if anything, it, things get a little bit better as the white dwarf <laughs> disappears and becomes a, a cold cinder. It's got the same mass and it's whipping the, uh, uh, the, red dwarf the lighter red dwarf around and so uh so i actually think in terms of likely science while uh stellar black holes and neutron stars would really be cool and possible i think this will could be really really interesting on the red dwarf white dwarf pairs that show up on the you know uh if the white dwarf is is super faint it's just going to be up on the red dwarf uh uh, branch, if, if at any rate, I think this. Uh, so I'm very interested in seeing us starting to look at red dwarf white dwarf pairs. Yeah, and I want to point out something else. Notice that. Oh, I didn't actually tell you about what the conditions were here. This was under a complete full moon. This data was taken. Uh, in the brightest possible moon. It was like 14 mags per square arc second, the sky background. So you don't have to do this under superb conditions either. There's a lot of telescopes out there. You know, I look at SRO, uh, Sierra Remote Observatory, cameras from time to time. But during the full moon, they're all part, they're, during any time when the moon is up, they're all parked. They're, I mean, and I'm, quite serious about that. There are, what, nine or 10 dome, domes or roll-off roofs or whatever. Nothing is being, almost nothing's being used during um, bright moon period. So imagine that you programmed up your scope to do this work while you weren't taking pretty pictures. Uh, how much information you could accumulate in a short period of time all over the sky. 
and you can be looking for elongated stars and you know there's a lot of stuff um here to to do that's quite i mean if i could ever finish the bloody software uh <laughs> that's probably the real problem <laughs> um you know you had there is an opportunity here to uh to do some serious science and i'm and this is great for students imagine Imagine, um, you know, students using this, uh, especially the elongation part of it. I mean, we could we could find elongated stars on the 24 and then move to the one meter to the speckle, you know, like the next week and we could um, have a discovery. And some of those discoveries are going to be important astrophysically. Okay. Yeah, Rachel just wrote in saying that she can imagine groups of students mm -hmm leveraging all that downtime in SRO to do a lot of discovery of black hole and neutron <laughs> stars. Yeah, we just have yeah. to find, we have to find the owners and convince them that Yeah, this is, well, uh, see, that, that's the thing. The, those people probably have no idea that this would be possible with their equipment. Because like you said, you know, they're interested in taking pretty pictures for the most part. Their, their scopes are completely down when the moon is up, you know? You don't need to have perfectly dark, pristine skies for this work. And uh, I can imagine more than a few people going, oh my gosh, I can do this. I want to be part of it. If they knew how to do it or they had somewhere to go where they could find out how to do it. So right. but like you said, you know, you're, you're not finished with the, the software yet, really. So, you know. Well, the software, work, the software works, obviously, because I can produce stuff like this, but I, I suspect it's not near anywhere close to being optimum in any aspect of it for, um, I've already think, I've already thought up a, at least a half a dozen improvements that would immediately make um, a difference, uh, uh, you know, so I don't know what to do. Anyway, this is the start of getting the word out. I want to, you know, yeah. Russ and I want to get as many people interested in this activity as possible. So we, and maybe we'll get some interest out of the folks that own um, telescopes in remote observatories. All I got to do is to program it up and take 30 second exposures and then move to the next field and take some more, you know, exposures and so forth. And the, a big part of the problem is, and then you can locally plate solve it. So you only have to pass the CSV files around. So it's not a big image transfer problem either, but the real job is going to be collecting the information, saving it in the right place on the web so that you can take those CSV files and process you know what i'm talking about there's a yeah. whole other aspect of data management in this mm -hmm. oh i'm yeah I, I can only begin to imagine you know what what i what, what i love about this is that you know with you know relatively small i mean small telescopes you know 114 millimeters my goodness richard um you can do some real robust scientific work. And that, that's why I, I think having your guys' work part of the Altaz workshop is so important because, you know, ostensibly we're all about making, you know, large, relatively large amateur sized telescopes by trying to adapt the technology that's been, been pioneered by the large observatories. Okay, and that's been, we've, we've done pretty well with that. But then, okay, then you have this marvelous telescope and you can look through the eyepiece and, and, and tour the universe. You know, that's, that's what I do um, because I, I, I still can and I love it. But I also know at some point my eyesight isn't going to be as good as it used to be. And I'm going to still want to explore the universe. And so being able to do something like this, the, 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 the double star speckle interferometry that, that Dan and I did together a few years ago was a real eye opener on, on how powerful and how fairly straightforward this type of work can be. And, and it's important. 
this is scientifically useful. So there's there there's having fun for fun's sake, and then there's having fun for for science sake. And I think that yeah, you know, having those two things, or finding a way to make that option accessible to more people is an important thing. And like you said, this is you know one step in getting the word out that this sort of thing is is really possible. And you don't have to be um, you know PhD astronomer to be able to do it. So you know, kudos to everyone involved. My gosh. Yeah, that's really amazing stuff. And I just wanted to put out there that I'm going to work with Dave and Russ, and um, I plan on having a course that I'll be teaching about how to do some of this work within a year from now. That could be open to anyone interested. At, um, who knew five, six years ago I'd be teaching double star astrometry courses all over the country and the world, <laughs> but that yeah. happened. So Russ, I'm going to be teaching a course on all this stuff in a year or so. I'm just putting that out there. So I'll, I'll <laughs> need help from okay. people. But, okay, the yeah. ball's starting to roll. Very good. <laughs> okay. okay, Mel sent in a question um, saying, then can you or someone set up a data pipeline that we can then submit images into for analysis so that we're not doing the analysis locally. Yeah, you know, I've, that, that question comes up all the time. Um, it's not my, you know, I have no expertise in how to do web-based um, anything. This plate solve resides on your local machine at the observatory and you just run it and it produces the CSV files and you could send those to a, a repository uh, of information, I guess. I mean, I really haven't thought that part of it through at all, Mel. I don't know what I even would do. I'm, I'm a guy that kind of loves to solve these little technical detail things, but I don't do the, I don't, really do observations. I don't, you know, you can probably see by now, I, I'm very disorganized myself. I can't, I can't find my own images um, half the time. So not me. Anybody else? Well, that was an enjoyable discussion. Thanks yeah. for your attention. I appreciate it. Fascinating presentation. Very good. So, okay. So I guess that's a wrap for tonight. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't stop sharing. Thank, thank you all. Sorry. And, um, you know, tomorrow, like uh, every, every night we start at 6 PM Pacific, you know, West coast, U S Canada time. Um, tomorrow night we start off with Mel, then, uh, Jerry, Ed, and then Akersh, um, which has a, uh, uh, fascinating presentation that I think we'll all enjoy. So um, it'll be a little longer than tonight. Um, in fact, the next three nights will be a little longer than tonight. Tonight was the shorter night. Um, mostly by design. I just, I didn't want to get us off to the start where we got all really tired right at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> so well, we, can, we can work up to that. But the, anyway, so tomorrow will be great uh, again. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll all be here again on uh, at six o'clock on Zoom and we'll pick it up. So thank you very much. And I look forward to tomorrow. I just have uh, one more question. Alan, yeah. what year and uh, type of car is that in your background? Uh, that is a 1967 Cougar. That's oh. awesome. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> a long time to get it looked like that. Yeah. So the if anybody else is interested, the other antique in the garage is that, which is a 1916 Warner and Swayze, 10 inch oh, refractor, wow. 10 inch refractor that now has a, a apochromatic lens. Whoa. Oh wow! Oh, and I don't use it anywhere near as much as I should. Oh well, you should give it to me then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use it. <laughs> the, 
it's oh, it's I, one of those it's one of those slippery slopes. The dome, yeah, a decent yeah. dome is expensive, and oh yeah, uh, I'm sure. I am president of the Antique Telescope Society, and we're having our annual conference that's going on on the weekends. So if you're not completely overloaded, uh, tune in this weekend for the last, uh, second two we in uh, days of our conference. In the morning, we have a couple of hours of of presentations, uh, talks about antique telescopes. And in the afternoon, we have uh, observatory tours. So we have uh, tours of observatories that have antique telescopes in them. Okay. Could, could you send a link to all of us for that? Because I'm sure some of us would enjoy it. I, I think some of you, at least some of you would enjoy it. It's, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's another really great crowd of people that you know, slightly different focus, but equally into it. Very good. Okay. I will. I will send it to Dan. Dan can figure out how to get it to the rest of you. Okay. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Hey, well, have a great evening, everybody. Yeah. It was, it was nice to listen. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. See you all tomorrow night at six. Yep. Bye. 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 Bye.